I greet you from Holy Cross Lutheran Church, Los Gatos, California, on this 15th Sunday after Pentecost. It's also Holy Cross Sunday. And the tradition of the church, September 14th, is celebrated as Holy Cross Day. And the Sunday prior to it then becomes Holy Cross Sunday. It's especially meaningful for us here because of the namesake of our congregation, Holy Cross. What a blessing it is as we focus on the cross of Christ that was made holy by the cleansing blood of Jesus. This cleansing blood of Jesus washes away our sin, forgives our sins, and what a blessing that is as well. It's very appropriate then that our theme for today out of our readings is about forgiveness from God and then to others. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desire with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning is now and will be forever. Amen. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We have a time for silent reflection. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father, most merciful God. We confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O God, our refuge and strength, the author of all godliness, hear the devout prayers of your church, and especially in times of persecution, and grant that what we ask in faith we may obtain. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading is found in the book of Genesis, Chapter 50, beginning at the 15th verse. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph, saying, Your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brother's sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of your servants, of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, 
Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle reading is taken from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. Accept the one whose faith is weak, without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall. And they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. So then, each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. This is the word of the Lord. Our holy gospel reading is taken from the gospel, the 18th chapter of the gospel according to Matthew, beginning at the 21st verse. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the gospel of the Lord.
Dear friends in Christ, we gather together around God's word from Matthew 18, wonderful story of Jesus teaching his disciples and also teaching us as well. And it begins with another question that the disciples asked Jesus. The reflection verse for today. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Well, this time, uh, as Peter asks that question, Jesus gives a direct answer. But then he goes on to teach them through a parable, a story about the uh, unmerciful servant, or maybe it's the merciful uh, king. Uh, but Jesus is very, very pointed and strong here when he speaks about forgiveness and what it means. We feel that uh, Peter um, is approaching Jesus, uh, having caught a little bit of the compassion and heart of Jesus in his quote-unquote generosity of forgiving someone up to seven times. Uh, more generous than the, uh, than the Pharisees of the day who said uh, up to three times. Uh, maybe it's our phrase of three, three strikes and you're out. Uh, and there Peter says seven. Hey, that's a good, good biblical number and uh, it's more than, more than generous. But Jesus pretty much stops him in his tracks and says, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Or uh, it's also possible to translate it as uh, uh, seven times 70. Uh, so we're talking about a, a great number. In Jesus' usual style, uh, he uh, uses a number that is meant to be something you're not going to count or, or keep track of in terms of this connection and relationship we have with each other. So he goes on to tell a story, a powerful story. And that story from our gospel uh, is there when Jesus begins, for the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. As usual with Jesus' parables, we know that the king in this story is our heavenly father. And this particular servant would be uh, you and me and our relationship with the father. Well, this is the good news of the story uh, and so wonderful. As we also come before God, uh, we've done that as we began our, our worship. Uh, we have uh, an enormous debt to God. Uh, this uh, burden of our sin, uh, uncountable, if you will. 10,000 bags of gold, uh, there's no point in even trying to put a dollar amount on that. It's just unpayable. Uh, you, you cannot uh, get out of that debt, and there's nothing you can do about it. So we come uh, humbly, uh, falling on our knees in confession, uh, daily, certainly weekly. And every week we hear from God the Father, for the sake of Jesus, that our sins are forgiven. It's called the absolution. It's being um, absolved of our sin, sins washed away. Uh, the the uh, illustration I like to, to use is think of the dry cleaners. Can't get the stains out. Water doesn't and soap doesn't do it. You take it to the dry cleaner and they use solvents, chemicals to get rid of the stain. Uh, so absolution, uh, solving, uh, absolving our sin. What a beautiful word. Things you can't get off of. And then the most important part of this part of the teaching of Jesus is to really know and believe that you're forgiven. Receive it for yourself. The truth is, is um, uh, that you can't forgive yourself. Uh, but you can receive God's forgiveness for you. Now, I understand sometimes the hardest person to forgive is yourself, uh, but uh, understanding that uh, by faith we receive that gift, believe in the promise and the trust of Jesus. This is what our Holy Cross Day is all about. The blood of Christ 
cleansing, washing us. It is about the gift that God gives to us, the gift of forgiveness, complete and full, uh, washes away the, the, not just the sin, but the stain of the guilt and the shame, enabling us to live before God and live within ourselves. Well, then um, Jesus moves on to the next part of the parable. And this first part's very important in preparing us for the second part and how God calls us to live. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him, began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened. They were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Well, how quickly we all forget or maybe don't really understand or take for granted this forgiveness of God. The truth is, is that as we fully receive this forgiveness and appreciate the significance of it, empowers, enables us, and opens us up to be forgiving to one another. Oftentimes, I believe we aren't willing or able to forgive because we're still angry and upset with ourselves for whatever our role in this is or somehow letting it happen or even taking the risk with someone else that we have an offense with or, or someone who's come to us with their own you know, confession of how they have wronged or hurt us. You know, it's important for us to understand that, uh, we, that we really are forgiven, really believe that. It is the power of God right there to, to forgive your sins. We don't earn it, don't deserve it, and it's given to us as a gift. Because of the significance of that gift, then God does empower us to forgive other people in the same way. But any time we think that we can't forgive someone, and I'm not saying it's easy, I'm not saying that it can happen immediately, but the truth is, is that this gift of forgiveness given to someone else is one that compared to what God has done for us, there is nothing to compare it with. We have 10,000 bags of gold versus 100 silver coins. Without even knowing the monetary value, the, the, the significance, the difference is huge. And so then we have an opportunity, not a burden, not even a law of God, but an expectation that we have the same heart our whole walking with Jesus, the whole point of Jesus' cross to forgive our sins and to restore and shape us is all about our being renewed in a relationship with God, whole within ourselves and then renewed with our fellow man. The truth is an unforgiving spirit is spiritual poison. When we refuse to forgive, we're basically endangering our own faith and salvation and ultimately putting up an obstacle for someone else. This freedom that we have received, when we realize the freedom that we have, the wrongs that others have done are like pocket change. They're real. They may hurt. There may be some memory of. But it's the path of Satan to lead us down into some bitterness or a grudge or to hold on to that. That's actually what's imprisoning. Forgiveness frees you. Forgiveness frees you. And it becomes something God empowers you to do. The significance of this, as Jesus always really emphasizes his points, is in the rest of that parable. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Ooh, those words kind of hurt. Those are pretty tough words of Jesus. But it's very important to Jesus, and we see even in the Sermon on the Mount earlier in Matthew, right in the Lord's Prayer, 
in terms of our forgiving those who sin against us. We pray it every week, maybe every day, as God would, again would empower us to do this. Jesus expanded on that there, and he does it again now. On This is our Christian way of living. Once again, it's our being. It comes across as understanding what God's expectation is, but empowered to do it. So God comes to us to change our hearts and our attitudes, ultimately to receive what he's given us to share it with someone else. Truthfully, forgiving is part of our childlike faith. It comes as trusting in God is what he is going to do that. So we, as we entrust ourselves in the enduring love of our gracious Heavenly Father, who daily forgives all of my sin, is exactly the well to draw from to offer forgiveness to other people. We find that it's important to have a repentant heart, both on our part as we become for Jesus, bowing on our knees before our Heavenly Father, a repentant heart even as we also are in need of others' forgiveness. So here's some of the challenges, even as we go back to the reflection verse. And Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 70 times. Well, how many times do you need to be forgiven? Well, I need it. In the marriage relationship, in the family relationship, in the church community relationship, in our neighborhood community, in our workplace, in our schools. How many times I need to be forgiven? And what, up to seven times? Limits on that? Conditions on that? Jesus says no. Like sin, erasing away our sin, no. Erase that. I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Wow, that's amazing. So as I've received a gift from Jesus, as I am in need of and received a gift from others to be forgiven, what more could there be joy in my heart to offer forgiveness to other people, genuinely, fully, and even as it's needed again? In the process, in the process, God is teaching us to understand how he can change hearts and minds. And forgiveness becomes one of the greatest Christian testimonies of who God is and the power and presence of God. As we join Jesus on his mission, offering forgiveness to someone genuinely, going to someone and asking for their forgiveness sincerely, can be one of those great blessings of our connecting with people. May Jesus bless us as he empowers us to live under his holy cross and offer forgiveness as we have received it from Jesus and from others. In his name we pray. Amen. May the peace of God that passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds in true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. We now confess our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. 
And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for all people in God and for all people according to their needs. My Heavenly Father, on this Holy Cross Sunday, we rejoice in the forgiveness that Jesus gives to us. The payment, not gold or silver, but his precious blood. And as we stand at the foot of the Holy Cross to receive that forgiveness, share that forgiveness, live in that forgiveness. We pray for healing and comfort for those in need, for Lorene, mother of Diane Stunkel, who's in rehab and has pneumonia, for Justin, son-in-law of the Stunkels, who was in a serious car accident. We ask that you would watch over and uh, be with him uh, and watch over his family. We pray also for Art Larson and his healing. Help him to continue to uh, move forward, uh, that you would enable him to uh, be full and well and whole. We offer a prayer of thanksgiving for the one-year anniversary of the liver transplant of Phil Eakin, nephew of Terry Berry, who's doing well, and we thank you for that miracle, that gift of transplants. We ask that you would be with our ministries here at Holy Cross. For our church council that meets on Monday, our children's center board that meets on Wednesday, guide and direct them, especially in these challenging times. Help us to use resources well that you have provided and that we would continue to join Jesus on his mission as proclaiming the gospel to all generations and fully to our community. We celebrate this week the birthdays of Ashley Black, Kelly Marie Govasi, Lucille Binns, and Joshua Peterson. Bless these individuals. They celebrate the gift of life that you have given to them. We also celebrate the wedding anniversary of George and Linda Lutz. Bless them with your presence of joy and that you would be mind, keep them mindful of their many blessings from you. We bring before you the needs of uh, our nation uh, for those uh, affected uh, so seriously by the wildfires in California and the other western states. We ask that you would be with those who fight those fires, watch over and protect them. Uh, be with those who have been displaced or hurt or mourn as we work together to rebuild lives and help us to find ways to continue to serve in times of need. We also ask that you would be with our nation in this election year, that your will would be done, that you would intervene in and the affairs of our nation. But we also ask that you would call upon us as citizens to honor you in the way that we vote and live and care for our neighbor. We ask that you would also bring meaningful dialogue and discussion that would help heal our nation. We look to you for that healing and help us to bring your love, compassion, and mercy in that process. We entrust all these things into your precious name as we pray the, pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.